You're very welcome to another episode of the Scaling Your Business podcast. For this episode, I am joined by John Kilcullen, the head of digital and social at Verve, the live agency. John, you're very welcome to the show. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Delighted to have you. Uh, typical fashion of the show, John. A couple of minutes getting to know you, and then we get into all sorts of different questions. Uh, we're wrapping it up with a popular question at the end, but we'll leave that till the end. Um, you, where'd you grow up? Dublin? I grew up in Dublin in uh, Parmestown, somewhere everyone passes through because it's on the N4 mm-hmm. on the digital carriageway. So everyone knows it, but uh, just to drive through, really, I suppose. It's quite a bad, small enough town. I am from a t- place similar. Everyone drives through it, Ratos, but uh, or if they live yeah. here, they just sleep here, but they don't live, live here. Um, mm. What was life like growing up there? Any favorite stand up memories? Any hobbies? Uh, yeah, just even Halloween, just the, the, the noise of the fireworks lately. Um, yeah. Looking for bonfire wood, it's all kind of coming back. Uh, but no, um, grew up in the 80s, so as you can imagine, uh, big housing is say, lots of families, lots of people, a lot of people the same age. Um, mm-hmm. So just overwhelming memory of um, playing a lot of football on the street. Uh, up to no good, climbing trees, messing, dossing. Um, yeah, just general good Dublin childhood, you know, uh, happy times. But uh, a lot of people in my age growing up at the same age. So it was, uh, it was, uh, yeah, full on, but great crack. Nice, nice. Um, what did you want to be when you were growing up? Like that younger John that you talk about, what did he want to be? I don't know. And it's funny because I remember when I was uh, doing my CAO at the time and I asked my dad, like, I was just, what should I do? And he goes, I thought, no, I just can't see it sitting at a desk. Um, you know, I was quite a high energy child, uh, to put it lightly. Um, but I didn't know, I, I wasn't sure. Uh, I always enjoyed solving problems and being outdoors. So I kind of figured maybe some kind of sporty adventure thing, but uh focus wasn't my thing as a child i was very much so involved in everything every sport every club badminton bowling football gaa soccer tennis i played it all so um yeah i i i, I had no burning desire to be an astronaut or a scientist or you know an engineer i just kind of uh yeah just had a lot of fun i suppose growing up nice there's no problem with that i pretty similar myself um you're now the head of digital and social at Verve, the live agency. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the reason we have you on the podcast. Um, so rather than me kind of talk about your role, the microphone is yours to tell the audience what it is that you do. Yeah, uh, well, Verve is kind of, it's a big agency. It's Dublin, London, Amsterdam, and we're growing into the States, hopefully pretty soon. Um, but to many clients who are many things, we are, first and foremost, events will be our bread and butter. Uh, events, I mean corporate events, I mean brand experiences, stadium stuff. Um, it's one part. Another part is brand activation. So roadshows, uh, experiential marketing type stuff. Another part, which is kind of my main deal, is kind of digital marketing and social. So my team will kind of act as um, a digital agency, uh, full service within the agency. So hmm. if there is an event or brand experience happening, we will provide the digital solution. That could be a website, it could be some cool technology. Uh, and then separate to that, I have my own client base, which we act as a pure digital agency. So social media, media buying, uh, website design, build. So uh, yeah, so we work through our own clients and also we work to other teams in Verve to add digital and social services to their clients, i.e. event clients and brand marketing clients. You mentioned the team, which leads me to believe that you're in a management role um, so the question I have around management is, is there a skill that you can think of that when you started out in your career, you perhaps weren't so great at, but you knew that it was critical to improve on if you wanted to be good in the role that you're in now? Yeah. Uh, scoping. Scope, 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 scope. Make sure you have thought of every single facet of the project before you commit to doing a full plan. Uh, reason being is, I suppose, in the industry working now, events is a big part of it. Um, it happens at a set time and date. You can't move it. You can't get around it. It happens when it happens. 
Uh, and to me, coming from previously, I worked in an, a, a digital agency, didn't do events, didn't do kind of live experiences. If the client added extra requirements, you added extra time to the delivery date for the most part. But uh, in Verve, uh, you're very much stuck to when that date is. So uh, when I started in Verve, I would have been very much so, yeah, take a brief, uh, it should be fine, you know, and then just crack on. But the longer I've been there, it's kind of more having to think about every way it could go wrong to make mm -hmm. sure it would definitely go right. And for me, um, what's been good there is really just talking to people around me who have more experience in some areas than I do, mm -hmm. talking to suppliers who've done it before and making sure that you kind of think about who to ask, what to ask, and from that, make sure that I create a, a strong technical brief for the team inside and also a strong creative brief. And never assume that, um, I suppose, uh, never assume that the first brief is the final brief, that it will always change as an event or brand experience that is live comes newer. So making sure that you fully scope and think about all the things that could come up in between and uh, planning around. Um, so yeah, just scope, lots of scoping. One of the reasons we got you on the podcast was because we spoke on LinkedIn a few weeks ago and you'd said that uh, you, you'd spoken about the impact the last 18 months has had on Verve. You needed to pivot to virtual events, underpinned, which were your words, by an aggressive paid and organic strategy. Can you talk to me about that? Uh, and then I've got a couple of questions we can go deeper on in some areas. But what was yeah. the pivot like that you made 18 months ago? And yeah. Yeah, it was, um, it was, I suppose Verve is like, um, it, it's experienced uh, phenomenal growth every year since I've been here and before that as well. So we've been very much so used to having good organic growth via existing clients, client, ref, uh, client referrals, and I suppose very little advertising. We just grew on reputation uh, and go to work. And a lot of that was digital agency type work. And most of it really was events and brand experiences. Uh, so when COVID hit, the digital side of the business was fine. Uh, we kept going, but the event side of the business took an absolute nosedive. Uh, and actually our, our CEO and founder, Ronan Drenner was in there at the Times last weekend. He did an interview. And to quote him, we went from having an order book of 100% to 2% over a week. Wow. Uh, so that's, uh, a, a drop of revenue in events of almost 100%. So that was a uh, quite a stark figure. And to pay the bills, the wages, in Verb, it's a big agency, so there's a lot of overheads. So we suddenly went from having things like EP on our book, Six Nations, uh, corporate events for Google, Amazon, and a lot of other companies to suddenly having nothing in the pipeline. And also no foresight of what's coming because no one knew when events would come back. So. Uh, we are an event management company uh, originally, so it would have been a case whereby virtual events is similar, but it's all online, streamed, mm -hmm. different setups. So we had the knowledge of how to run an event uh, quite effectively, but we needed to upskill quite quickly in terms of uh, doing virtual events. So bringing in suppliers, talking to different people. So that was easy because uh, we have good people, uh, we know what we're doing, and then we've got great suppliers as well. However, um, every company who do what we do, we're all chasing the, the business and trying to tell clients that we're the best events agency that now do virtual events. So uh, we invested quite heavily in a few things. Uh, one was just time in learning everything we could about virtual events. Two was we wrote a white paper about how to do virtual events, how to run them, uh, best practices, good case studies. The reason being is that on Google Trends, uh, the word virtual event does this and then this. So yeah. there's a, a massive leap in terms of search queries for virtual events. So we kind of thought, let's just put it out there. Let's create a landing page that talks about virtual events, how they work. And it's not private. It's, it's not gated whereby you have to give us an email to get, this, uh, get, get, get free information. We just put it out there and let anyone from competitors to clients look at it. Uh, reason was is that it kind of put us at the forefront of being, I suppose, a thought leader and someone in the industry who very much so could help and could help clients get up and running ASAP with virtual events. 
uh, went really well. We did a, a webinar with Dublin Chamber, uh, with myself and a couple of people. We call it the virtual events webinar. We got a lot of big companies in Dublin tuning in. Uh, so that was all just outreach with PR we, we did internally. And then secondly, we put a lot of money around AdWords, whereby we bid, we outbid everyone on virtual events for three months to make sure that when any client or any person in the industry put in the word virtual event Dublin, virtual, uh, virtual event agency, we were top consistently every time. Uh, very, very, very well ran financially. So we had deep reserves to kind of fall back on. Um, so we had the resources to put money behind media ASAP. And uh, it meant that we got a lot of leads from uh, people like Google, Microsoft, um, got Amazon, new client. Uh, yeah, just they all came to us fairly quickly with queries of and how do I do it? How does it work? You know, can you live stream? Can we bring in green screen? So suddenly, uh, with the white paper out there, a lot of one-to-one -one outreach as well with our clients and also uh, owning the top spot on Google with a paid media strategy uh, meant that we got a lot of leads in very, very quickly. Uh, I mentioned before, we didn't put much love into Google AdWords before COVID. Uh, we just grew organically really well with a small bit of advertising in print and a bit of display here and there. But uh, we hadn't got a choice. We knew people were Googling virtual events uh, but it was just putting place a strategy uh, to make sure that we were top of the page every time for every result. I think we had a top of page result of something like 80%. So uh, we wow. very much so took the market over for a few months. Yeah. Um, but it, it paid off and also we ran a lot of ECRM, did some one-to-one uh, -one client meetings whereby we said, hey, you've got in the pipeline, but do you want to have a chat maybe about virtual events, how they work? So, um, Alongside the paid media, we kind of ran a lot of just, you know, workshops for clients uh, free of charge, just let them know, you know, how we can help. And it worked really well. And then clients who originally would have run real events start coming to us, you know, for uh, virtual events. So, yeah, but it, it required the entire agency. So the digital team, the PR team, um, the account managers, everyone got involved from lead gen, lead chasing, um, advising on what AdWords we could use because, um, you know, it, it's funny, we all call ourselves agencies in this business, but our clients call us companies. So uh, an insight for us was that we always assume that people to let us search for the words virtual event company or agency or digital agency, but most people search for, for the word company, which is kind of yeah. an interesting insight. Um, but yeah, and a lot of SEM rush, a lot of daily analytics and also, we hired a dedicated uh, paid media manager uh, around COVID because we knew that we had the money to spend, um, but also very much so uh, we saw this as a way out of COVID to, you know, spend away with advertising to generate leads on the back of the, I suppose, existing client referrals. But yeah, so I, I suppose just to wrap up your question, we went from having uh, the worst year ever to potentially having the best year ever. Um, so our growth in 2019 was record and our growth this year will be on par. So we haven't done a real event uh, this year and we're looking like we're going to do a, our best year ever. So it's been good. Wow. We haven't, yeah, so it, it's been a crazy, crazy turnaround, but um, it took a lot of people and a lot of pain along the way as well. You know, for a couple of months there, we're kind of staring at the abyss thinking, <laughs> Like what's going to happen? Uh, <laughs> but luckily, we've got good people, and uh, we had good financial reserves to kind of fall back on. It, very interesting. You you spent the first half of your uh, chat there talking about uh, the pivot, and then the latter half to me was talking about what you did to oh. attain new clients: SEM Rush, Google Analytics. You briefly touched on the attain part, attaining current clients. And I know, I think his name, you said it was Ronan, um, did an article where you went from 100% to 2%. But I imagine like within the first couple of weeks, you kind of looked at your current book of clients and go, what can we do here? Even if it's just like pro bono to keep them on the book so that when it does come back, is there anything you can tell me about what you guys did to attain your current book of clients so that they didn't completely disappear so that when the world had come back you can kick start off from where you left yeah we had our head of events our, our md our, our all of our senior staff 
on the phone, ringing up brand managers, uh, senior client managers, asking them, you know, do you require any virtual event services? Do you want to have a chat about how they could work? Uh, what are your plans for your Q4 launch? You know, so we knew these people had stuff to do. Um, if you're, say, I don't know, if you're like um, a Foster Ireland who are well, one of our early clients uh, with virtual events, uh, they had to get out there and do an event to talk about COVID and the industry and tourism. So we said, we actually built a green screen studio in our office for that event. So we said, we'll host, you guys come in, we'll, we'll, we'll set it up. We probably came in, um, you, you know, uh, probably came in quite reasonable cost-wise because it was one of our first big virtual events. So we're just kind of getting them, I suppose, getting clients in and getting them used to what we can do. Yeah. Um, but very much so, we will be your guide and we will help as much as you can if you come to us with the business. So uh, it was, I suppose, yeah, putting it out there that we're available to help. And a lot of, I suppose, yeah, a lot of outreach, a lot of just knocking on doors to say, you know, do you want to, uh, do you need anything uh, in the meantime? Uh, that event that was in real life, does that have to happen as a virtual event? So yeah, just, um, yeah, I suppose a lot of just old school picking up the phone and just ask me, how are you? How are you getting on? You know, do you want to chat to us about virtual events? So um, yeah, just kind of, yeah, I suppose looking out for clients. So in, in yeah. Rare, we, we have a thing where we're, we're always all in. Um, if a client comes with a deadline, that's crazy. We'll just get it done. So it's that kind of mentality was very much so. It's about helping the people as much as it is the business. So we're very much so uh, all about making sure that people who are our clients make sure that they do a good job because we help them and vice versa. And now that you think of the position you're in now, having gone through a lot of that, um, and you're looking at 2022, um, is there anything you can think that companies out there, not Verb, but other companies, uh, could do to up their great game uh, when they're looking at their digital strategy for you know Q1 to Q4 2022? Something that you think other companies like perhaps overlooked that could cost them revenue that if they were to pay attention to in 2022, it could increase their bottom line revenue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, every day we look at our analytics, look at our AdWords, look at our lead gen, look at what kind of leads we get. Uh, it's daily and even every hour at times. Uh, if we get a lead in to the, the website, the first thing I ask Simon, who's our lead, uh, who's our paid media guy, is that, was that an ad? Was it organic? Was it a phone call? Was it a form? Was it an email? So we're constantly looking at where business comes in. And it's something that previously we didn't do enough of because we just grew um, organically via, I suppose, just, you know, just reputation kind of got, got us a lot of growth. Uh, mm -hmm. But during COVID, it really focused us in on um, effective paid media to make sure that we're constantly pinching every penny every CTA is fine-tuned to make sure it hits the right audience. Our SEO was looked at almost weekly. Our AdWords was daily, whereby we find out what pages are getting most traffic, why is that today, why wasn't it yesterday? So it's very much so, if your business relies on lead generation, uh, never turn off. And I suppose in Verve, we've gone through, since, since I started, uh, three websites in terms of full redesign and full launch. The first two we built and just put it out there, it's great, everyone loves it. Uh, the third time we launched was about six months ago, uh, brand new design, brand new CMS, built from the ground up. Uh, and we kind of treated it as a never finished project, whereby um, it's constantly been updated, always been tweaked, landing pages have been changed every few weeks to make sure that they're um, converting. Because with virtual events, uh, you know, our clients are, say with COVID, our clients are still at home. They're not coming in for coffee, we're not meeting them at events. We're not networking as much as, as we used to. So our shop window is very much through our website. So we kind of treat it as a never ending ongoing project that needs constant optimization and fine tuning. And it's something that I would say any, to any business owner or any head of digital, uh, never think that your site's finished. It's never finished because mm -hmm. it can always do better or work harder or be improved. Is there a tool that you use day to day that you can't live without? Um, I suppose from a B2B point of view, uh, it will be 
SEM Rush and just the AdWords dashboard and analytics. Um, very much so, we have changed our spend in the last couple of weeks based on volume searches for real events and brand experiences. Uh, there's been a dip in virtual events. So we're checking SEM Rush for search volume on, on events. We're checking uh, our conversions uh, cost per click for events on. So we're just trying to find out what's generating leads uh, on the back of that, putting together the data from Google Trends, SM Rush, and our AdWords dashboard to see what's working and where our spend should go. So for example, this month, we're getting a lot of leads for uh, in-person events. So we'll probably pair back virtual events because um, the demand is still there. It's not going away. Mm -hmm. um, but we also want to get back into full swing with real events as demand picks up. So our strategy will, will probably change a little bit in terms of where we put a spend. But that's based on a daily look at uh, conversions, uh, click throughs, and all that kind of stuff. In preparation for this podcast, I, I did my research. And one of the things I noticed on your LinkedIn, that's one of the places I go for research, is a month, maybe two months ago, you put up a post about hiring for an account manager. Yeah. So what do you look for when hiring an account manager? What are, you know, top, top kind of three or four things that you pay attention to that are red flags and also green flags? Yes, good question. Um, so the role that you mentioned just there was for a guy who recently left and that guy was kind of a bit of a MacGyver in terms of his ability to make stuff happen out of nowhere. Um, and that's fair. Uh, sometimes a digital account manager is running paid media. And the other time they're at an event with 15 VR headsets, making them work for a Coca-Cola brand experience, for example. So in that sense, um, for that role, it was very much so about a person being very resourceful, a quick thinker, uh, maybe has experience outside of agencies, potentially in a kind of, you know, a hands-on role, uh, could be retail, could be anything really, uh, because it, it says to me that they've experienced problem solving, fighting fires in other industries, for example. Um, so in that case, it's kind of an all-rounder, but someone who can think on their feet and solve problems. Uh, however, for a role that was kind of more about client management and client services and digital strategy. I'm looking for experience uh, working with brands for more than a year. So someone who's managed a relationship, say for a big brand, knows how these, these companies tick, know how to talk to people. So you've got lots of layers in big companies where well, you have to kind of, I suppose, realize that your idea might take lots of sign off internally. So someone who's used to working with a multinational and understands that uh, decisions take longer to make and also that the campaigns that you pitch or manage have you know lots of stakeholders yeah so someone who's just good at articulating ideas mm -hmm. uh, good at articulating um, good at I suppose articulating um, timelines scope of work that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and someone CV with that would typically have a degree in marketing um, because they can I suppose they can take like a marketeer a bit better. Um, someone for another role is kind of more hands-on with technology. I'm not really fussed about their college education. If they have it at all, I don't care once they can kind of get the job done and once they're kind of smart, quick thinkers. So um, yeah, for the strategy role, they look for a bit of education background in marketing, a bit of experience with brand or agency. But then for the kind of more tech roles, it's just really a, a techie and nerd just someone who likes technology, getting their hand dirty, can do a bit of coding, doesn't mind MailChimp, doesn't mind pulling out cables or the Raspberry Pi, just general kind of all-rounder. Um, mm. And also just a positive attitude. Um, you know, you can tell straight away in an interview whether someone's going to be good to be around, positive, you know. So for me, it's important that no matter how busy or stressed you are, you know, you're in this with other people. And also... Um, don't worry about being stressed because there's people around just to help. So you can generally tell if people will be good under pressure, but also good fun to be around as well. 
and not afraid to get their hands dirty, but also not afraid to say, listen, I need help on stuff kind of project. So it's kind of important to be um, a hard worker, but also realize that when you're too busy, you have to talk to your manager or talk to your colleagues. One of the questions I like to ask guests to come on the podcast is around secondary school. And it's if you could add a mandatory subject to the secondary school curriculum, what would it be and why? Um, I think computer science, coding. Um, you know, you see a lot of jobs these days um, for marketing roles that require coding or HTML or, or, or Python, for example. Um, I think just the way stuff is going, you know, every every job will have some kind of tech team involved or if you work for a company, in some manner of speaking, you'll work with a developer, be it web, you'll work with an IT person. So I think having, I suppose, good computer science knowledge um, in terms of how stuff works, uh, the principles of software engineering, coding, databases. Um, I did it in college for two years and did national search. Uh, and I left it and did four years in something completely different, arts. But the two years I did in soft, uh, in, in in computing have stood to me far more than anything I, I did in the other course, other than crack, I had a, a lot of fun in the other course. Um, but the, my two years in, 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 in computing uh, have stood to me, even though it was 20 years ago, uh, it's yeah. really stood to me as something that I, I use every day in my life in terms of like, fixing the HGMI cable to talk to developers, um, you know, or, or designers about how to design for coding. John, it's been an absolute pleasure spending the last 30 minutes with you. Interesting to hear how you guys pivoted. Uh, didn't know that it went from 100% to 2%. That's shocking, but glad to see that uh, you had the, the reserves to uh, power through it and uh, appreciate some of the lessons you've shared from the free white paper you created uh, to, you know, outranking people on Google ads to be there for a virtual event company, not agency, another lesson learned. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to unpack in that. And I hope the listeners who've spent the last 30 minutes listening to this enjoyed it as much as I did. But uh, for now, that's the end of the episode. And thanks again for joining me, John. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.